go. All right, so we are recording. Um, we are moving on to propositional logic today. I have started to grade the exam, um, and you know, it's I've only graded like seven or eight out of a class of 35, so I cannot really give you any statistics at this point. Um, but I can tell that one person has got a perfect score already. So, okay, I was kind of impressed, you know, getting a perfect score in an exam like this. Um, so, um, not much I can share right now, you know, just because, you know, it's a sample of six or seven out of 35, you know, it's not very significant. Um, but we are moving on to this new propositional logic uh, topic. Um, we are basically done with relations, you know, because we have already talked about totally ordered, um, you know, relations. Uh, it's basically partially ordered plus what we call comparable. And th did I talk about comparable or totally ordered? Okay, let's go back and talk about that first, and then we can move on to propositional logic. Oh, by the way, there's a homework too. So the homework is due next uh, Monday. So you have seven days to work on this one, just like the usual ones. Um, and this is relations. And we are almost done, except for the last part, which is you know, totally ordered. So we've completed partially ordering already, because partially ordering simply means you know, a relation over a particular set is reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive. So once you know, those three require, requirements are met, then it is called partially ordered. So totally ordered is partially ordered, plus one more thing, which is you know, what we call comparable. And comparable you know, is expressed like this, or one way to express it is like this. So for, every, for, for any way, every way to choose elements for E and F in a particular set X, the relation has to go from E to F or F to E. And it's a regular or, it is not an exclusive or, okay? So it can go in both directions, but has to go at least in one direction. In other words, if you pick any two elements from the set, they have to be related in one way, at least one way, okay? So that's basically you know, totally ordered, um, which is partial order, partial ordering, plus the extra requirement of being comparable. So do we have any questions about you know, what is comparable by itself? In other words, you know, this particular quantified statement, do we have any questions about that? No? Okay, all right. <clears throat> so as you might have you know, realized in the previous exam, the notation is very important, okay? So we are gonna use the same kind of notation pretty much throughout this entire semester. Um, and this kind of notation is not something that is only going to be important in this particular class um, because you know, that's also what most mathematicians and computer scientists you know, make use of in terms of expressing statements, theorems, and so on. So you know, kind of important to you know, get that notation down. All right, so do we have any other questions regarding relations before we move on to uh, propositional logic, which is a whole big new topic. Relations is kind of like a small topic. No questions? All right. <clears throat> um, oh, I can also show you guys what the exam looks like yeah, when I'm grading. Um, let me see, X1K, there we go. All right, so this is a good, Example, okay. I'm not showing the, the answer of anyone, so it's going to be okay. This is the key to version 1.3 of all the exams. And this is what I use for grading. It would show me all the possible answers to a particular question. Like for question number one, in this case, there are, you can look at all the possible answers. Some are partially correct and some are you know, totally correct. So this one is totally correct, this one is totally correct, all the other ones are partially correct. So I have basically, I have a program to generate all the possible answers, and I'm just matching your answer with one of these, okay, and you'll, you'll just kinda check, out the, check off the items. That's what I'm doing when I'm grading your exam. And it was a lot of 
it was a lot of fun, I have to admit, it was a lot of fun writing a program to do this, to basically generate the answers. It's the same program that generated all the questions, but to make the same program to generate the answers in a way that I can use easily for grading purposes, that's kind of fun. All right, so I will give you the keys, okay? So I have already scanned all the exams, <clears throat> so I, what I would do is I'm going to use a Dropbox approach. Um, so every single one of you will have a shared folder that you have view access to. So the scanned exam along with the key will be dropped off into that folder that you have access to. So that way you can go back, you know, you can, you don't, if you want a paper copy, fine, you'll get the paper copy from me. But if you're okay with the electronic you know, version of your exam, you will have that too. So that's what I'm planning to do, but right now I'm kind of busy actually doing the grading, so all the Dropbox you know, thing will be done after that. All right, so that's kind of you know, where I am standing in terms of grading. So I'm going to go back to the topic that we are going to talk about today, which are, which is propositional logic. So this is where we are going to be talking about for a while. I'm expecting we'll stay on this one for about two weeks, maybe a week and a half or so, okay? So it is a kind of interesting topic. All right, so propositional logic is based on your know, proposition, and if you look up propositional logic as a term on Wikipedia, there are lots and lots of explanation. The bigger question is why are we interested in propositional logic. This is not something that is specific to computer science. It, all, it existed long before computer science. Computer science basically started to exist at the end of World War II when Alan Turing you know, created the machine to decrypt um, messages that were encrypted by the Enigma machines. But propositional logic, on the other hand, has already existed for more than a thousand years. Okay, So if you look up that propositional logic. Wikipedia has a page on it. There we go. It's also called propositional calculus. So they're basically referring, referencing the same thing. So if you look up, okay, let me see if, if they have a history on. There we go. All right, so here's the history. Three century, the third century BC. That's a long time ago. Okay, I would say that's a pretty long time ago compared to you know the lifetime of the of the entire field of computer science. So it has been around for a long time. It is mostly logic slash your know, math. So how is that important in computer science? Okay, I, I'll give you some idea, you know, just an overview of what it is. It's about proving something. So why is that important in computer science? Why? Why do you want to prove theorems in computer science? That's basically the, the question that I'm asking. What theorems are we talking about? Okay, so let's, let's, di di let's digress just a little bit, okay? We'll, we'll look into some problems when people are not rigorous when they're coding. Uh, one particular one is called um, I'm trying to remember the name of that thing is a is a vulnerability it's called hard bleed I think yep that's what it is okay so it was I do remember correctly all right so the hard bleed bug is an entirely software bug where you know a particular key piece of software you know in the SSL engine in open source your programs it contained a bug that allowed people to um, potentially get the encryption key and other really really important stuff from the buffer in the program. So the question is okay. It has a lot of implications, okay? You know, it was plugged really quickly, but it had a lot of implications in terms of cybersecurity. The bigger problem for us in this class, in the context of this class, is how is that related to theorem proving? 
So let me ask you this question. If you are given a particular protocol, okay, HTTP, or in this case SSH, or the SSL you know, standard, how do you write your program to conform to the standard? You read the standard, right? When they say, okay, this portion of the packet is supposed to have 32 bytes, then you go like, okay, I'm gonna allocate 32 bytes as a local variable, put stuff into it, and then I'll start to process it, right? How often do you think constantly? What if somebody is to hack this program? Can I really trust that this portion is going to be only 32 bytes? Even though the standard says this is supposed to be a 32 byte buffer, it's supposed to be null terminated. Are you going to say, yeah, okay, I'm just gonna play by the standard. I'm gonna write the program when making the assumption that the packet that I'm receiving is playing by, playing by the rules. Most programmers think in that way, okay? You're given the standard, you understand the standard, and then you program based on what the standard specifies. You're not gonna program and think all the time. What if someone wants to hack this program? Even though the buffer is only supposed to be 32 byte, 32 byte long, and it's containing a no terminated string, what if somebody is to specify a no terminated string that is longer than 32 bytes? Most people do not think like that. And that's basically one of the problems of the heart, beat, heart bleed bug is, you know, that was not accounted for. If no one has malicious intent and, you know, everybody's paying by the rule, this is not a problem, okay? It, it's not a bug in any way. It is when people do not play by the rules intentionally to try to break a program that it became a problem. So how does that relate to this class, to theorem proving? What theorem are we going to be thinking about in this context? Okay, what, what, be, what would be the purpose of the theorem? The theorem would specify that only if everything plays by the rule that you would process the, the packet. If it doesn't you know, conform to the standard, you're not even going to process it. You just report an error and go like, nope, this is not conforming to the standard, I'm not processing it, okay? So that is a specification. You can specify the correct behavior of a piece of program, an algorithm, using a theorem, okay? You, using statements, okay? The, the same kind of statements that we have been using in this class. Do you guys still remember how I can use you know, um, a theorem or a statement to describe the proper outcome of the sorting algorithm. We did that before, right? So that was relatively easy. This is a little bit harder. So let's assume that you can express the correct behavior of a program as a statement, okay? Which means it is a statement that can either be true or false. Let's just say that it is true if and only if the program behaves correctly and the, the theorem will be false when the program does not behave correctly, okay? So in order to assess a piece of code that somebody has written, including chat to GPT, <clears throat> now you can go through an automated theorem proving mechanism so that the computer can look at the source code and try to prove the theorem. If the theorem can be proven, then you don't even need test cases because you have mathematically proven that regardless of how the input is going to look like, the algorithm would do the right thing, assuming that the theorem is expressed correctly. Is that okay? All right. So I will bring up one more page just so that you, if you're interested, you can look that up. It's called Automated Theorem proving, or something along that line. <clears throat> ATP, or automated deduction, is a subfield of automated reasoning and mathematical logic dealing with proving mathematical theorems by computer programs. So basically, you're having a computer to prove theorems. Automated reasoning over mathematical proofs was a major impetus for the development of computer science, but we are also going to use it to help improve cybersecurity. Now, can you use something like this to prove the entire operating system is correct? Theoretically, yes. Practically, probably no. 
but you don't have to do it to the entire operating system. You only have to do it to key portions of the operating system. Okay, it's because if the if the operating system is only going to crash, you know, if something happens, it's not as bad as you know, revealing you know all its content to the world. So this is the reason. Okay, this is the rationale of why this topic is important to us. Okay, because you know you can also look up other things such as um, cyber security and program verification. And now you can you know, basically find out you know why these two topics are related. So the importance of verification in cybersecurity and verification is automated theorem proving. So are we establishing the importance of this topic despite you know it is an area of math that has existed for a long, long time already because we want to automate the process. All right, so with that said, we're going to go back to the module and we get, we'll dig into the details of you know, what um, propositional logic or propositional calculus entails. All right, so there are five components to a propositional logic system or calculus. So these five things, each one is a set. So we have alpha as a set, omega as a set, zeta as a set, and iota also as a set. These are five sets. Each set has a particular purpose. We're going to start with you know, the alpha set. The alpha set is a set of symbols that we are planning to use, and symbols have no intrinsic or inherent meanings. Okay, so by themselves, you know, alpha does not really do a whole lot of useful stuff. So we're going to you know, create a system on the fly as we talk about this. So I'm going to use the tablet to basically just start to create a, a calculus system here. So I'm going to say alpha is going to consist of P, Q, R, S, T as the English letters. Um, I'm going to put in, you know, throw in constants. You know, zero is a constant, one is a constant. So the difference between a constant versus an English letter is P, Q, R, S, T are known as quote unquote variables. In other words, is P true or false? We don't know, okay? Is Q true or false? We don't know. In other words, you know, the P, Q, R, S, T can hold Boolean values, and those values are not known um, intrinsically. Zero and one, on the other hand, do not hold values, they're constants. Now, what does zero mean? What does one mean? They're not meaning what you think they're meaning, okay? They're, they're nothing more than just symbols, but they do not have values. They're not variables. So I'm going to put some additional stuff here, okay? So these are variables. These two are constants. And then we have some awkward, you know, Greek letters, okay? So I'm going to use um, psi, uh, phi, and theta, and potentially rho, okay? So we can include a bunch of your Greek letters. So these things have a really funny name. They're called schematas. Scheme, S-C-H-E-M-A-T-A-S, schemata. But they are basically placeholders, placeholders, okay? So the purpose of the Greek letters will be, we'll talk about that later. So right now, all we have to know is they are not variables and they are not constants. They belong to a different class of things that we need when we want to work with propositional calculus. Do we have any questions about you know, the set alpha? It establishes the, the lowest level symbols that we're gonna use in the system. Yes, go ahead. Mm-hmm. not intrinsically so we can assign the meaning later on yep all right so with all of these symbols the next thing we're going to define are things that we can do with these symbols okay so that's the purpose of the omega set so typically with the omega set you know there are subsets of the omega set they are not uh, with no intersection so these are disjoint subsets so there's omega one and there's omega two in this case. 
The subscript basically just says, you know, how many operands do we expect with a particular operator that is in that omega set? Omega one consists of all the operators that has one single operand. Omega two contains all the operators that have two operands. You can potentially have omega three, omega four, and so on and so forth. But most of the time, when we are talking about logic, we are talking about what negation. Conjunction, disjunction, implication, um, equivalence, which is also known as if and only if. So omega one and two are more than sufficient for most practical calculus, uh, uh, propositional calculus systems. So in this case, we are going to define omega one to be a set that only has logical not in it, and then omega two has the usual, the typical operators. Like conjunction, disjunction,、uh, implication, if you want, and then if and only if, if you want. Okay, so so there, are, these are fairly typical、um, operators in omega two. So omega without a suffix is really just a you know union of these two sets.、And、that's about you know all we have to say about omega. Are we still doing okay so far between alpha and omega? Okay, one defines the what. Symbols we can use, you know, to represent something. Okay, some are variables, some are constants. The other one defines you know, the operators that we can use to express to have expressions. We good so far? All right. So the next thing we need to talk about are well-formed formulas. Okay, WFF, not WTF. It's WFF. So we have W F. F, which stands for well-formed formula. Okay. So the definition of a well-formed formula is relatively simple. From our perspective, if something looks syntactically correct, it is well-formed. That's about it. Okay. So if you try to use two operands for something from omega one, it's not okay. If you only want to use one thing, one operand for something for an operator in omega two, it's not okay. But as long as as long as you play by those rules, you're fine. Okay. So let's take a look at how well-formed formulae are defined in the notes here. So this is where you know we define what is a well-formed formula, WFF. So the first thing is、um, I have a predicate. Called is a well-formed formula, so the predicate is true if and only if the parameter is well-formed. Is that okay? Does everybody understand what this predicate means? Is a well-formed formula is a WFF returns true if and only if whatever the parameter is is well-formed or is considered well-formed. Is that okay? All right. Okay. So we'll work with the first bullet point. The first. Okay. So once again, we have a quantified expression using the universal quantifier. What is that saying? For every element e in alpha, that element by itself is already well formed by definition. Is that okay? All right. So switching back to our example here. So all that means is p is well formed, r is well formed, zero is well formed, and so on. Is that okay? Does everybody understand you know the how this? Okay, so I'm just gonna. These are all well formed formulae as examples. I mean there are many more, but I'm just gonna use these three as examples. Are we doing okay? Any symbol from alpha, from the set alpha, is well formed by definition. Yep.、Mm -hmm. So that's the basis, okay? Because then we're going to define well formed formulae in a recursive way. So we are basically dealing with all the base cases right now. So the next statement is a little bit more cryptic, okay? So we're going to have to spend some time to take a look at this one. So this is saying for every i. As an element of one to n, okay. So i can be one, i can be two, i can be all up to, all the way up to n. 
is a well-formed formula phi of i, which means now I'm identifying that, you know, okay, there's phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, and so on, and they are well-formed to begin with. So if this is the case, if I can find myself n well-formed formulae, and on top of that, I choose an operator from omega n. Now, remember, you know, we don't deal with omega 3 or 4. We only deal with omega 1 or 2. Okay, so for all practical purposes, this is just omega 1 or omega 2. Okay, but whatever this C operator is requires n operands. Is that okay? So n is important because n is telling us how many operands C requires, and it is also telling us that we have already found n well-formed formulae, and they are named phi 1 to phi n. Is that okay? Up to this point. What we're given with. This is an implication. So this is the entire left-hand side of the implication. What does that imply? Well, it implies that if you apply C as an operator to phi 1 all the way to phi n, this entire thing is also considered well-formed. All right, so that's pretty abstract, you know, a little bit difficult to read, but it describes what needs to be described. So getting back to the example, let's go ahead and take a look as an example here. Um, we know P is um, well-formed right here. We know R is well-formed. We know, you know zero is also well-formed. Why? Because they come from the set alpha. Are we good there? Okay. So now I'm going to choose an operator from omega 2. Let's choose ampers, I mean a logical end. Okay? So now I say, well, if I put P on one side and R on the other side, is that well formed? The answer is, yep, it is going to be well formed. How do we know? Because P by itself is well formed, R by itself is well formed. And how many operands do we need? for the wedge symbol, which is what we know as the conjunction symbol. Two, right? So I have two well-formed formulae as operands to an operator that requires two operands. Okay, I think that expression is well-formed. So that means you know, this is a well-formed formula. Okay, so if this is well-formed, then can I make another one like P and R that's one thing, choose a or on the other side, and then on the other side, we just have yeah, R, on, R by itself. Is that well formed? Well, let's take a closer look. This is an operator from omega 2, which means it expects two well formed formulae as its operands. Okay? Is P and R well formed? Yep, we just showed it earlier. Is R well formed by itself? Yes, because it is one of the symbols from alpha. So that means this entire thing is also going to be well formed. Is that making any sense? Okay. Now, just being well formed does not mean it is meaningful, okay? Because you can do you know, things like this P is well formed, P and P is well formed, P and P and P and P. It's also well formed. This whole thing and P and P and P and P is also well formed. Yes, you can make an infinite number of well formed formulae, and many of those are not going to be very useful, which is perfectly okay. Okay, we are simply defining the, syn defining the syntax of what is a well formed formula. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. For those of you who have taken linear algebra, you can look at the alpha, the alpha, the set alpha and the set omega as what you need to quote unquote span a well-formed formula space. The well-formed formula space is basically just a set of all well-formed formulae based on the alpha and the omega that you're given with. Now, many of those well-formed formulae is not going to be very useful. It's not going to be very meaningful. But nonetheless, they do exist 
in that well-formed formula space. Are we doing okay so far with that concept? Okay. Then let me ask you one question. Do you think this well-formed formula space, do you think it is finite, which means it has a fixed, uh, a finite number of elements? Or do you think in this case, okay, given the alpha and the omega that we have, or do you think it is an infinite space, a space that has an infinite number of elements? Infinite, very good, okay. So given the alpha that we have and given the omega that we have, we can span a space of well-formed formulae that has an infinite number of elements. So that is going to be a problem because we basically have a haystack that is infinitely large. Okay, so we'll keep that in mind first, okay? We'll talk about a few other concepts before we get back to the problem of having a haystack that is infinitely large. All right, so we move on to continue to talk about, um, let's see here. We'll talk about iota, okay? So iota is a set of well-formed formulae or well-formed formulas that are known to be true, imagine that in the space of well-formed formulae spanned by alpha and omega, some of the well-formed formulae are labeled true. Okay. All right, so getting back to our example here. So we can, you know, in our iota set, we can say, mm, I'm just gonna define one as a symbol to be true. Okay. I can define the negation of zero to be true, okay? I can also define other well-formed formulae to be true. So for instance, I can now define hmm, P implies Q is true. Now, does that say anything about P itself or Q itself? No, all it says is the implication is true. The statement is true, the expression is true. Do we know whether P is true or not? No, not, not by this particular you know, statement. Do we know whether Q is true or not? No, we do not know, okay? And then we can do something you know, kind of wonky, like you know, oh, we can also say that P and R is true. Does that mean P is true? Kind of yes, okay? But at this point, we don't know, okay? At this point, we simply know the well-formed formula of P and R is true. So when I say P and R, the and is only referring to the symbol. It is not referring to the conjunction meaning that we normally associate with. In other words, an operator is nothing more than a symbol on a keyboard or that you can write. It has no intrinsic meaning whatsoever. Are we doing okay so far? Does everybody understand when I say there's no intrinsic meaning to the operators that we are you know, putting into uh, omega? Okay, it means that there's no truth table. You know, emperor's n, I mean, um, uh, conjunction, disjunction, implication, and if and only if, they are nothing more than just symbols. There's no truth table associated with these operators the way we are describing it at this point. All right, okay, all right, any questions? So, so, yeah, go ahead. So anything that is outside of IOTA are not given to be true. They're not axiom axiomatically true, which doesn't mean they're not true. It simply means they're not axiomatically true. So, but everything in IOTA are given to you as true. Don't ask me why, they just are, okay? So that's what IOTA is, it's a starting point, okay? So we have introduced three sets at this point. We have alpha, which defines all the you know, symbols that can hold values that can be true or false or constants, but they, nonetheless, each one can only be either true or false, or a placeholder, which is kind of like a weird thing. We have omega, which is the set of operators, but the operators do not have intrinsic meanings. All they are are just symbols. They are also called connectives, 
okay? You know, if you read other textbooks, what we call operators, which is a computer science term, they're also called connectives in you know, uh, classic propositional logic uh, description because that's all they do. They connect things. Alpha stuff do not make connections, okay? They're kind of individual things. And then you know, the omega, you know, elements of the omega are known as connectives because they are used to connect things. Between alpha and omega, we can span the well-formed formula space, which means I can say, oh, these things are syntactically correct, okay? Based on you know, omega and alpha. So now as a subset, of the space of all the well-formed formulae or formulas, iota is a subset. What is special about uh, iota is everything in iota is quote unquote uh, axiomatically true. In other words, don't ask me why, okay? They are just true. Are we doing okay so far with these three sets? Okay, so now we're gonna get into some of the more difficult you know, sets to explain. So now we have Zeta, okay? Zeta is a set consisting of rules that connect mode individual well-formed formulae in the well-formed formula space. Okay, so this is where things go a little bit difficult to understand. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use an example and then we're gonna, we will come back to describe you know, this thing here, which is a little bit more on the abstract side. So I will give you some examples. Okay, so in this case, I will say, so instead of giving you the entire set of zeta, we'll just give you one element first. So each element is a two-tuple, okay? So the two-tuple consists of um, two things. The first thing is always a set. This is a set of patterns to match, okay? So we're looking for patterns. In this case, we're looking for a very simple pattern we are simply looking for something, I'm using psi here, uh, using conjunction here with phi. So this is the pattern that we're looking for. The pattern is applied to things that are known to be true at this point, okay? Now that would include everything in iota, but also everything else that we can quote unquote indirectly or deduce to be true at some point in time. So this is a pattern. We're trying to match a pattern. And then this symbol here means infers, okay? So means infers. And then on the right-hand side of the infer symbol, we are making use of symbols like this. And then we are going to go like, okay, so what can we infer to be also true if we find a pattern on the left-hand side that is true? So in this case, we can now infer um, phi psi is true. So this whole thing, this entire thing, okay, put over all parentheses, can be an element of zeta. Okay, this is a rule. The rule says if you can match this pattern, then whatever is used to match psi can exist, can be true by itself in the space of well-formed formulae. Well, let's try to apply this, okay? Now, what is not um, usually, you know, it's implied is, you know, uh, most, all of the, most of the operators are um, commutative. So if you don't like, you know, things being, you know, making the assumption that certain things are commutative, it's okay. Make a second rule for phi. So we make a second rule, okay, which says, you know, if you see psi and phi as a pattern, then you can also infer phi to be true, and it is also an element in zeta. So with both of these, you know, rules in zeta, now we have taken care of, you know, commutative. All right? So now let's try to apply this to the iota that we have. See the iota that we have, which is, where did I put it? Uh, right here, okay. This is the iota, iota that, that we have. So we try to match, okay? Does one as a constant 
match the pattern of something and something? Nope. Okay. How about the negation of zero? Nope. Does not match the pattern of something and something. What about P, what about P implies Q? Nope. That does not match because it's not using the same operator, right? What about P and R? We got a match. Okay. So once we have a match like this, then we quote unquote instantiate and say, okay, since these two patterns are matching, then we can say, oh, okay, so P can be the psi, and then R can be the phi, and now this rule can fire. Are we doing okay so far in terms of matching the pattern with existing things that are already known to be true? We good with that? Okay. So now we can say, hmm, okay. So I'm going to write down here all the way down here. And we can say, um, psi and phi inverse psi. We know that um, there's P and R. So that means you know, when we combine these two, we can now infer that P is true. Okay, is that okay? Does everybody understand what that means? In some other textbooks, you know, instead of writing things in a horizontal way, they stack things up in a vertical way, but it, they mean the same thing, okay? We, we can fire this rule because we can match this pattern to this pattern here. But because we, when we match the pattern, P is used to instantiate the psi here. So that means P by itself is also true based on this particular rule. Is that okay? So when we use the second one, we can also infer that um, R is, let me see. Yeah, we can also infer R is true because you know, we can find a different rule. Okay, this is considered a different rule because this time we are inferring you know, phi, you know, based on, you know, psi and phi. And then we're going to use the same thing, the same element in iota, which is P and R. But this time we are inferring that R is true. Is that okay? So that's what an inference rule is, and that's what it does, okay? It is a pattern matching thing. It specifies a pattern matching rule. If you can meet all of these patterns in the set, then we can label that thing to be true also. Is that okay? All right. So let me um, turn the page here. But there are certain inference rules that are funky. Okay, they're, yeah. I cannot use anything other than being funky to describe them. So this is an inference rule that is kind of funky. There's no pattern to match. In other words, I don't care about what you have in iota, okay? Then what can you possibly infer to be true in this case? Well, pick a Greek character, pick a you know, schemata. Let's say psi, okay? I'm gonna say psi or not psi is true. You go like, huh. It kind of makes sense, but it's also kind of stupid. But that's the way it works, okay? So in this case, we have an empty set on the left-hand side of the inference, which basically says, I don't care what is already labeled to be true. I don't care at all. Pick any well-formed formula in the entire well-formed formula space. And that well-formed formula or the negation of that well-formed formula is going to be true. You go like, yeah, that makes sense. But it's also kind of stupid to have this rule. Well, it's not stupid, okay? Sometimes it's actually useful. But this is also another inference rule that you can stash into zeta, okay? So basically, zeta consists of a bunch of rules like these, okay? Each one, or you know, I should say, usually a, a few of them would match a particular rule in Boolean algebra. Okay, so in other words, I'm basically reinventing Boolean algebra in the form of syntactic operations. 
match this pattern, match these patterns, I should say, match these patterns, and that thing will be true. Are we good so far? Now, there's one particular you know, rule that is really helpful in theorem proving. I will describe it. So the pattern that we are matching, there are two items in this set now. So we're going to say, OK, the first one is psi implies phi. The second one is psi. And that is going to infer um, phi in this case. That is usually also in zeta. What does that mean? Now, this time we have two items in the set to the left-hand side of the inference. So this time, what it means is, okay, find me something, find me something that looks like this. It's an implication, okay, that is known to be true already. It doesn't have to be in iota. It just has to be labeled true at some point in this entire chain of reasoning, okay? Just find me an implication that is true. If I can find the left-hand side of the implication by itself, and it is also true, then I can infer that whatever is on the right-hand side of the implication, whoops, sorry, is also going to be labeled true. Now, remember, this is all syntactic operation. In other words, all you're doing is you're just pattern matching, you know, in a syntactical way. It, is, it has nothing to do with the truth table of implication. But it is consistent with the truth table of implication. Is that okay so far? So a you know, counterpart of this rule is another one. Now, if you look up in the textbook, you know, they will refer to these things by name, and I'm poor with names, so I'm not going to do names here. Okay, so this is the counterpart to it. We still have an implication that says you know, psi implies phi. But this time, you are saying that, oh, we already know that not phi is proven to be true somewhere. Okay, once again, it doesn't have to be in iota. It just has to be labeled true as part of the chain of reasoning. So what can we infer? Well, actually, in this case, we can now infer that psi is not psi is true. This is also a typical rule in, um, in Zeta. There's a name to this. I cannot remember. Okay, there, there are Greek names not easy for me to pronounce nor remember. But these are the basic stuff that you throw into Zeta. So as you can probably imagine, Zeta has a lot of things, okay? Um, I can throw another one in, okay? If you want to kind of look into this, okay? You can say, oh, we, we can see this is true, okay? Psi or phi is true. Uh, we also know that psi is not true. Well, that means, you know, phi has to be true. Does that make sense to you? Even though this is completely just syntactic, but when you look at the meaning of the Boolean operators, does that make sense to you that if we know that psi or phi is true, the disjunction is true, but we know one side of the disjunction is false, doesn't that tell you that the other side has to be true? Yeah, kind of makes sense, right? And then you also got stuff like this, okay? Let's find this, and let's find this, okay? In other words, find me a well-formed formula that is true, we call that psi. Find me a well-formed formula that is true, we call that phi. They can be the same thing. They can be different things. I don't care. As long as each one is true, then it matches this pattern. Then go like, so what is that going to infer? Easy. That's going to infer the conjunction between these two also has to be true. Is that okay? Okay. So as you can probably imagine, there's a lot of stuff that we can you know, put into zeta based on linear, I mean, a Boolean algebra. This is all based on Boolean algebra. So you go like, okay, so what is the whole point of doing this? The whole point of doing this is to prove theorems in a rigorous way. 
So what do you mean by proving theorems? What is a theorem anyway? So let's go back. I'm going to, let me go back to the previous slide. Let's go back to this one. I'm going to clean this up a little bit, okay, because it's getting a little bit hard to read. So I'm going to rewrite everything on the third page. But I want to preserve you know, iota the way it is. So I just have to remember what it looks like right now. Okay, I got it. Okay, turn page. Come on, go, go. There we go. All right, so I'm going to rewrite everything here. This is alpha. We got P, Q, R, S, T. We got zero. We got one. We got um, psi. We got phi, we got theta, we got rho, okay? So how many um, English letters and how many Greek letters you want to throw into the whole thing is not really that important, okay? If you want to express something that's really, really complex, you can throw in more of these things. If you want to express something that's simple, you, you don't need as much, okay? Um, we already talked about, um, oh, okay, go back, go back, or I can just erase, nope. No. Why is it not working? <sighs> All right, fine. <laughs> okay, so some of the gesture is not being recognized. Why? All right, okay, just cross this out. <laughs> And we'll go ahead and use omega. Okay, so omega has um, negation, conjunction, disjunction, implication, if and only if. Okay, so I'm just repeating what we had earlier in the slide. Just kind of clean it up a little bit easier to read. We got iota. Okay, so iota has one, the negation of zero. This P implies Q. It has uh, P and R. That's what we have. Okay, so I think I recaptured everything. And the zetas are, you know, I'm not gonna repeat that because that takes a lot of writing. What I do want to show is, let's imagine we have a space, okay? Let's, we have, let's say we have this you know, gigantic, infinitely large space of well-formed formulae. And we got certain special elements in here because they are known to be true to begin with. So one is known to be true, not zero is known to be true, P implies Q is known to be true, P and R is known to be true. And then it has got, oops, sorry about that, because now the gesture is back. Okay, but we also got a lot of stuff that eh, is not really useful in this case, okay? So we got uh, Q sitting somewhere out here, we got T sitting somewhere, somewhere out here. We got S sitting somewhere out there. And then we got T, uh, S, and T, Q, or R, and so on. You know, they're all out there, okay? I'm just giving you examples. You don't have to copy everything down. So out of all of these things, there's also Q, okay? So Q is also sitting just out here by itself. So out of all of these things, which ones are known to be true because that they are members of iota? That's easy. That bunch of stuff on the left-hand side, right? So we'll put a circle, okay? We're gonna circle everything that is known to be true, either because they are in iota to begin with, or because we can use inference rules to say, oh, now we can label that guy, okay? So we're gonna say, yep, this guy's in iota, this guy's in iota, this guy's in iota, so is this one here. So these are known to be true, they are axiomatically true, which means don't ask me why they are true, they are just known to be true. Are we good so far? Yep, go ahead. Axiomatic, which is, which may be a word that I'm making, making out of, <laughs> but I think it's a real word. Let's find out, axiomatic. Yep, it's a real word. It's derived from axiom. Yep. And I said axiomatically. Is that a real word? 
According to Cambridge, it is good enough for me. If the Brit says it's a real word, it is a real word. But don't ask the French. <laughs> I did not know that in France, if you have a child, you can only choose from an approved list for the names. You cannot just make up a name for your child. That's France. <laughs> I don't. I don't think Elon Musk would want to live in France. Anyway, okay. So we got other things too. Okay. So um, out of this here, okay. Um, let's fire some rules. Okay. So what rules are we going to fire? No, I'm, I do have to apologize. I have to kind of go back and forth this time. So let's find some of these things in Zeta, okay? One of those things in Zeta is this one here and also this one here. In other words, let's find patterns. Let's find a conjunction, okay? And if I can find a conjunction that is already circled, then I can circle you know, the left-hand side by itself. I can also you know, circle the right-hand side by itself. Does that make sense, okay? Are we doing okay so far? So far? okay, all right. So we are going to go back to the diagram, and we go like, do we have a conjunction? Yep, we do. This is already circled, so it can help you know, with firing that rule. And when those rules are fired, I can now say, hmm. All right. So p by itself can now be labeled, and then r by itself can also be labeled. Where's r? Okay, let's just say it's here. Is that okay? So I can now, you know, I can even draw an arrow here and say, you know, because P and R is true, you know, I can now label P by itself to be true. And because of P and R, I can now label R to be true because of those two rules that we have just talked about. Are we doing okay so far with this picture at this point? Okay, all right. So now I look at this and go like, oh, there's a whole bunch of rules I can also fire. Right, you know, just using the, the empty set rule, the one that looks kind of stupid, which is this one here, I can now you know, fire that rule and go like, oh, okay, any well-formed formula and the negation of itself is true. Okay, so we can now say, you know, S and T or the negation of S and T is true. Even though we have no idea what is the value of S and T, it doesn't matter because whatever it is or the negation of itself has to be true. So we can now start to label stuff you know, in this space. So this is purposeless, okay? We're just randomly applying those rules and labeling stuff. Theorem proving basically means there's one particular well-formed formula that you want to circle. Okay, so let's just say that we want to see whether R, not R, Q is going to be true or not. Okay, so we are basically saying the proposed theorem is Q. Okay, so the question is, if I keep firing those your know, propagation, I mean, uh, if I keep firing those inference rules, can I eventually circle Q? That's the question. That's what theorem proving is all about. Okay? It doesn't matter what your discipline is. It can be algebra, can be trigonometry, can be linear algebra, can be Boolean algebra. It doesn't matter what it is because what you're given with is a bunch of axioms. Then you're given certain facts and your theorem is basically a statement that can be either true or false. The question is, can you link whatever is axiomatically true using only the inferences to eventually label the theorem, the proposed theorem, to be true as well? It's basically a chain, or I shouldn't say a chain, because chain implies it's linear. This is more of a mesh of inferences, okay? So in this case, we go like, okay, so we are interested in Q. We want to label it. The question is, what can I use to label Q? So let's go back to the, some, some of the other rules, okay? So we identify this one particular rule that will be 
helpful, this particular one. So what does this one say? It says, I'm looking for an implication. Psi implies phi. So by the time I search, I find, by the time I find that implication, I would have determined what psi is. Then I want to see whether psi by itself is also circled. It doesn't have to be in iota, but it has to be circled. So I'm looking for psi implies phi as a statement or in, as an expression that is already circled. I'm looking for the same psi by itself, and I need it to be circled as well. If both of those requirements are met, then we can go like, oh, okay, whatever is on the right-hand side of the implication, let's circle that one too. Is that okay? So this is what the pattern matching is all about. So now we go back to this picture and say, hmm, can we find an implication? Oh yeah, we got one implication right there. P implies Q is already labeled, it's already circled. It's in iota to begin with. So we don't even ask why is this labeled, because it's in iota. So if this is matching psi phi, then the psi is P, right? So now we are asking, is P by itself also circled? Mm, yep. It's not in iota to begin with. We had to find another rule to get it circled, but it is circled by now. So that means between these two, I can now label Q. So that means you know, I can now do something like this. I'm just you know, drawing the lines you know, to um, help visualize what leads to what. So if all I really want to say is, can we label Q, can we circle Q? Mission accomplished, I'm done. This is my proof. Is that okay? This is an example of how propositional calculus is applied to prove a theorem. Now, is this a complicated theorem? No, this is a really simple one. Is it meaningful? Well, that kind of, impl it, it, that kind of depends. Because you know, when we are thinking about this, the next thing we want to think about is, so what does PQRST really, really mean? That's kind of up to you. So you can say P is tax classes are boring. Okay? Well, does that mean that tax classes are really boring? No, it's a variable. It can be true, it can be false. What about Q? Okay? So you can look at Q as um, students in tax classes tend to fall asleep. Okay? Sort of makes sense, right? Tax classes are boring implies students in tax classes tend to fall asleep. Seems to make sense to me. What about R? Well, R can be something else. So we have P and R being true. So R can be something that's totally unrelated. It's just something that is also true coincidentally. So P is tax classes are boring, and R can be tax your know, tests are easy. Okay? So if you are given that tax classes are boring implies students in tax classes tend to fall asleep, and then you're also given that tax classes are boring and tax exams tend to be easy, okay? Well, the exam being easy has nothing to do with what we want to prove, which is, oh, do people actually tend to fall asleep in tax classes? That's what we want to prove. Is that okay? So using this chain or mesh of logic, we can now prove that Q has to be true as well. So that's what the PQRST are really representing. Each one is representing something that can either be true or false. But you don't have to know whether they are true or false because you can also just say that, okay, we know the implication is true or we know the conjunction is true. We don't need to know individually which variable is really true or not. We can still come to conclusions of sorts. Is that making any sense? Okay, so this is a very, very mechanical way of proving theorems. It's based on pattern matching. Okay, and pattern matching is something that computers do really well, okay, especially with regular expression and parsers and whatnot. You know, you know, syntactical operations on the computer is like super fast and easy. But we have a problem. 
okay because if the if if the theorem that i'm proposing is okay this is one which is easy to work with what if the theorem that i want to prove is t in other words i want to know whether we can eventually label t or circle t or not okay now obviously in this case the answer is yeah probably cannot because everything that is given to you in iota does not include t at all okay so the only thing you can really conclude about t is t or not t is true but it doesn't tell you whether t itself is true or not okay so intuitively we have the answer already but if you use the mechanical method that we have just described now you have a big problem because the haystack is infinitely large and you don't even know whether the needle is in the haystack or not and the job is to find the needle don't you think that's going to be a problem let me describe the problem again tech is giving you a task there's a haystack is infinitely large and i'm asking you to find a needle so what if i tricked you what if the needle is not in the haystack when are you going to come back to me and say, Tag, I don't think the needle is in the haystack? You won't, nor will your descendants. <laughs> because the stack is infinitely large. Okay, there's an infinite number of elements in the, in the haystack. If you're just blindly applying these transformations or your know, inference rules, yeah, you'll be you'll be searching through the haystack, okay? You'll be labeling things, but you can never confirm that T by itself cannot be circled. Are you guys you know, seeing the problem here, okay? So how do we fix that problem? I'm looking at the time. Let's go ahead and take roll, okay? Because I think this is a good time to take a short break and then we'll kind of come back to this and talk a little bit more before the end of the class. So let me go ahead and open up the road taking activity for today. It's the 26th already. I didn't take road for two weeks. And the word is infer, all lowercase. <clears throat> All right, I'm just going to write the word on the whiteboard in case someone wants to refer to it, infer, okay, and you still got about 10 minutes to do it if you're, you're not on the site directly. All right. So this is the problem. This is the conventional um, propositional logic system. And it is a problem because you know, if a statement is not a theorem, good luck you know, showing that it is not a theorem. Okay? So what are we going to do? So I can give you a map of what we're going to do in this class. Let me switch back to the tablet. There we go. OK. So the first thing we want to do is I don't want to deal with an infinitely large haystack anymore. Okay, that seems to be the problem. So we want to limit the size of the uh, space. So we want to have a finite <clears throat> well-formed formula space. Because once we have a finite space, then we can probably do exhaustive search of some kind to deal with it. Okay. So that leads to the discussion of CNF, or conjunctive normal form. All this stuff is in the notes, in the modules, and I really hope that you guys would actually read the notes, you know, hopefully before, but definitely after each class, okay? It is really important. So that will lead to the discussion of CNFs, which then will lead to the discussion of the equivalency between CNF and general Boolean expressions. In other words, the question is, 
CNF is a very restrictive form of Boolean expressions, okay? The question is, if I were given any regular Boolean expression, can I convert to an equivalent CNF? That's the question, okay? Do they have the same expressive power? Even though one seems to be far more flexible, the other one seems to be really restrictive, can I do the conversion one way, you know, in, in one direction, okay? And the answer is yes, okay? We'll talk about how to do that. When this is all done, then we'll also talk about resolution. Resolution. So in this case, resolution refers to a particular way, a particular transformation, okay? It's really kind of neat, okay? Because you know, the result of resolution is you're always reducing something complex into something that's less complex. You're getting rid of variables in the expressions when you apply resolution. And then we'll talk about uh, proof by contradiction. So proof by contradiction is a very powerful proof technique. Usually, um, things that cannot be proven directly, there are ways to prove it by contradiction. I can give you a quick example. The pigeonhole principle, prove it. What is the pigeonhole principle? You have more pigeons than there are pigeonholes. At the end of the day, all the pigeons are returning, okay? So every pigeon has to go to at least, go to one pigeonhole. Several pigeons can fit into one pigeon hole too, okay? But every pigeon has to go back to a hole, you know, to, for the night. So the theorem says that at least one pigeon hole is going to have more than one pigeons. You have more pigeons than there are pigeon holes. And I'm asking you to prove it. A direct proof is very hard. But a proof by contradiction is easy. Because all you have to say is, well, let's just say that that is not the case, which means every pigeonhole can only have up to one pigeon in it. How many pigeonholes do we have? Less than the number of pigeons. So when you add up all the pigeonholes, it would not, it would still be less than the number of pigeons. So that causes a contradiction because you know, we started off with the assumption that there are more pigeons than there are pigeonholes. So that is basically proof by contradiction in a nutshell. It's a very important and useful technique to prove theorems, okay? It is not proof by counterexample, okay? The you know, counterexample can only prove that the theorem is not right, okay? It is not true. You can find one case where the theorem does not apply. So proof by contradiction is not this proof by contradiction. So those two are a little bit different. So we'll talk about all of those things. And then when everything is done, then we'll end up with a mechanical way of proving theorems. In other words, we'll condense all the um, infer inferences down to like a few, like one, okay? And we'll have a mechanism to convert any general Boolean expression to CNF. And then using resolution and proof by contradiction, then we end up with a very mechanical way to prove, to show whether a theorem, a proposed theorem is a theorem or not. It will be conclusive because you have a finite space. So at some point, if the proposed theorem is really not a theorem, you will know. You go like, oh, this is a dead end. So tech, you just tricked me. You gave me a statement that is not a theorem. Okay, because you don't have an infinite space to begin with anymore. Okay. So that's kind of where we are heading in the next, I think, uh, two or three classes. Um, and we'll have homework assignments you know, in each individual part so that you get a chance to practice them. And that's about all we have for today. Do we have any questions? Okay, so one thing I need you guys to do, okay, two things. <clears throat> The first one, okay, let me go back to the notes here. So the first one is knowing what you know now, okay? Please read the module and relate the examples that I have used today to the more abstract way of describing things in the module, okay? I think this is going to be very important. And then the second thing I also want you guys to do 
is to finish reading, you know, this section, this entire section here with all the funky symbols and whatnot. Um, and I need you to go to at least get to resolution, okay? So if you can start reading resolution, you know, including this part here, it'll be great for our discussion on Wednesday. All right. So I will see all of you on Wednesday. I'll upload the video as soon as I get a chance.